Hey everyone, in today's Wrath of Math lesson, we're going to talk about vertex disjoint paths in graph theory. Their name really gives away what they are, but in this lesson, we're going to talk about some examples of them and some different types of vertex disjoint paths. My intention in presenting this lesson is to start preparing us for a proof of Menger's theorem, which we'll go over in a future lesson. It was a viewer requested video, so looking forward to that one a lot. Uh, whether or not you watch that video, hopefully you've got a reason to be here, and I think you'll enjoy the lesson. Let's get into it. Now, what are vertex disjoint paths? You probably have a good idea what they are, if you remember what disjoint sets are. Remember that we say two sets are disjoint, like these sets A and B, if they have no elements in common. So their intersection is empty. So what do you think vertex disjoint paths are? Well, of course, predictably, vertex disjoint paths are paths that have no vertices in common. So what are some examples of vertex disjoint paths in this graph here? Well, there are plenty of examples. Here's just two examples. Suppose we consider the vertex, or excuse me, the path A, going from the vertex A to the vertex B to C to D, and then another path B going from E to F to G. So, this path A goes from A to B to C to D, and the path B goes from E to F to G. Those two paths are vertex disjoint. They don't have any vertices in common. Of course, if two paths are vertex disjoint, then they are also edge disjoint, because an edge is a, it's defined by a pair of adjacent vertices. So if two paths have no vertices in common, they certainly have no edges in common. One thing I want to make sure is clear is that the positions of the vertices in the paths doesn't matter when deciding whether or not they're disjoint. Let me make it clear what I mean by that by changing this example a little bit. Suppose we consider the path B to be the path going from D to C to F. These two paths are not vertex disjoint. Their first vertices aren't the same, and their second vertices aren't the same, and their third vertices aren't the same either, so in some way you might think they're vertex disjoint, but that's not what we mean by vertex disjoint paths. They do have vertices in common. They have the vertices D and C in common. It doesn't matter that they appear at different points in the paths. So that's the point I want to make there. Now, of course, there is a possibility that we could consider a weaker definition of vertex disjoint path where perhaps the paths start at the same vertex, but besides that are disjoint. Let's look at an example of that. And let's start using uh, normal path names like P1 and P2. Let's do that. So consider a path P. We'll actually call these P and Q. So consider a path P going from let's say D to C to B, D to C to B, and then another path Q going from D to E to F. These two paths are vertex disjoint almost, except for the first vertex. The first vertex of both of those paths is the same. The path P goes from D to C to B, and the path Q goes from D to E to F. So, we might call these paths disjoint or vertex disjoint paths, even though they aren't really by the definition we just went over. But in some cases, it might be useful or convenient to call these paths disjoint paths. And the context might make it clear what we're talking about. Of course, we could also have the reverse situation where, say we've got a path P prime that goes from B to C to D, and a path Q prime that goes from F to E to D. These two paths are vertex disjoint, kind of, except for their last vertices. Their last vertices are the same, but besides that, all of their vertices are different. And so again, they're not vertex disjoint by the typical, you know, easy to understand definition that we began with, but in some cases, it's useful and convenient and clear from context to, to call these disjoint paths. And we know that we just mean they have no vertices in common except for their starting vertices 
or except for their ending vertices. Now, of course, we can sort of combine them into the final situation, which is really, uh, so far as my experience goes, the most important one, which is when we have paths that are internally disjoint, meaning they have no vertices in common internally, but their starting and ending vertices are the same. For example, let's consider some internally disjoint B, E paths. So we can consider the path P1. I'm running out of breath. Pretty, pretty late night lesson I'm recording right now. So P1 goes from B to C to D to E. And let's say P2 is an internally disjoint path going from B to E. It goes from B to F to E. So again, we call paths like this internally disjoint. They are disjoint internally. None of their internal vertices are the same. And by internal vertex, we mean a vertex that isn't the starting or ending vertex. So these two paths start and end at the same vertices, but otherwise they are disjoint. Just to point them out here in the graph, P1 is going from B to C to D to E. P2 is going from B to F to E. So what is at all significant about internally disjoint paths? Well, one important thing, since we've got two internally disjoint BE paths here, we could delete any internal vertex from either one of these paths and B and E would still be connected in the graph by the other path. That's kind of important. So we could delete the vertex F, for example, and B and E would still be connected by the other path because it was internally disjoint from P2, which we deleted internal vertices from. Or we could delete C and D from P1 and B and E would still be connected by P2. Now, one more thing before we call it a day, and this is the most important idea I want you to get from this lesson. So let's zone in and focus here, and hopefully we can make this really clear. What would you say if I asked you how many internally disjoint BE paths there are in this graph? At first, you might think, well, we've got these two paths, P1 and P2, which are internally disjoint BE paths, and a quick observation confirms that we can't add any more internally disjoint BE paths to this collection, so maybe the answer is two. But then you might think about it a little, more, a little bit more and think, well, you know, maybe that doesn't totally make sense. And the reason it doesn't totally make sense is because the question doesn't totally make sense. So, so what am I talking about? What do I mean? Well, consider another path, Q1. Imagine we're just starting a new collection of BE paths. Suppose Q1 is the path going from B to C to F to E, B to C to F to E. Now, if we look for another internally disjoint BE path to include with Q1, there aren't any. There's no, there's no BE path internally disjoint from Q1. Any BE path in this graph has to start at B, and then it has to either go to C or it has to go to F. Obviously, obviously if it goes to A, it can't get to E because it has to go back to B and then it wouldn't be a path. So it's got to go to C or F, but this path includes both C and F. And so if we start with Q1, we only get one internally disjoint BE path. So is it one or is it two? Well, we need a more specific question. The question we probably want to be asking is what's the maximum number of internally disjoint BE paths in the graph? And in this case, of course, even though we can only make one if we pick a path like Q1, if we're a little bit smarter about the paths we pick, we can get up to two internally disjoint BE paths. And in this case, that's the maximum number. And so that's touching on the idea of Menger's theorem. Menger's theorem says that if we've got two non-adjacent vertices in a graph like B and E, the maximum number of internally disjoint paths connecting those non-adjacent vertices is equal to the minimum number of vertices that we need to delete to disconnect those vertices B and E. So for example, in this case, since the maximum number of internally disjoint paths is two, 
we can delete a minimum of two vertices. That's the best we can do is disconnecting B and E by deleting two vertices. So they can't be disconnected by deleting fewer than two vertices. Like we sort of went over earlier, delete F and B and E are still connected. Delete C, B and E are still connected, and so on. But if we delete the right pair of two vertices, if we delete F and C, B and E have now been disconnected. It disconnects the graph, and B and E are in different components. So that gives you a little bit of a taste of Menger's theorem. Don't be, you know, frustrated if you, if you didn't catch that, because I just ran it by you real quick. We'll certainly talk about it more in a, another lesson coming pretty soon. Uh, but for this lesson, really hope you just got the idea of vertex disjoint paths. And again, we say that two paths are vertex disjoint if they have no vertices in common. But sometimes we, we might want to consider disjoint paths that only have starting vertices in common or only have ending vertices in common or are internally disjoint and so they have no vertices in common except for the starting and the ending vertices which are the same. And, of course, there is a maximum number of internally disjoint paths connecting two vertices in a graph. You can't just pick any paths you want and get to that maximum number like we saw here. If we start with Q1, there's no other internally disjoint path we can include that connects B and E. We've got to be a little bit smarter to find the maximum number. So I hope this video helped you understand what vertex disjoint paths are in graph theory. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions, need anything clarified, or have any other video requests. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time, and be sure to subscribe for the swankiest math lessons on the internet, new lessons every two days. Hurrah!